Y'all make it back okay, Bill? Uh, yes. Yeah, everything was uh, fairly fairly smooth. Um, so we got back around 8.30 or so. That's not too bad. No, not bad. It wasn't bad at all, thankfully. I guess it was uh, smoother on the way back than on the way over there. Yes, correct. The weather was uh, highly unpredictable. Beautiful one day and awful the next the next two days. And then by the end of the day, Sunday, it was beautiful again. Yeah, it was a little hard to tell on TV. It looked a little hazy, but still like finally yeah. the sun was coming Yeah, the sun was, the sun was starting to break through then. Let's see. Oh, what am I doing here? Dismiss. Not that. No, I don't. What am I doing? I don't want the waiting room. There we go. Okay. Okay. That's my. That's weird. All right, uh, good afternoon. It's uh, 2.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, if you would just indicate if you have a question in the chat, and we'll follow that order. Um, since I think, I think Wilson was the first to log on, we'll let Wilson start it off uh, with a question. Okay. Lead off hitter. Wilson, yeah. the lead off hitter today. Yeah. I wish I had as much power as Dylan. I don't think I'm that kind of lead off hitter, unfortunately. Then we'll have to move you to the three hole. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you, you mentioned, you know, 08 yesterday and how you think that in some ways this could be similar to that kind of a season for y'all with, with the slow start. What are some things that you might be, you know, maybe have learned that season that you're trying to apply now as you coach this team or uh, is there anything that you're sort of drawing on from that experience? Well, you know, I'm always trying to be optimistic with the kids, Wilson, and, and um you know, I told the kids after the, we got back that, uh, you know, uh, our 08 season, we had a lot of young players. It was my first recruiting class uh, that was – that we were counting on, guys like DJ LeMayu and Micah Gibbs and Leon Landry. Uh, they were all freshmen on that team. Um, we had – a lot of second year players like Ryan Shim from Blake Dean, Sean Ochenko, Jared Mitchell. I think one difference was that they had gone through an SEC schedule the year before. They had taken their lumps uh, my first year here, but they, they at least had gone through an SEC schedule. But I, I told them, you know, that a similarity was we had gone to Tennessee that year in 08, except it was the first weekend of the season, not the second weekend. And we had been swept at Tennessee as well, including a walk-off grand slam in the last game of the season, uh, last game of the series, excuse me. Jan Gomes hit a grand slam walk-off, and we also had to play a doubleheader on the final day. So we started out that season 0-3, and, and we actually were on a five-game losing streak, and things looked gloomy, you know. Everybody was down on us. Everybody had written off the season, and and, and things didn't get a heck of a lot better for a while. Uh, we, we actually were like 6-11-1 in the league at one point. Uh, and then, you know, we, we got better as the year went on. But I, I knew throughout the season that year that we were really close. Uh, we, we had a weekend against Georgia where they were the number one team in the country. 
and, and we hosted them here and, and they were a really great ball club. And, and we went 0-2 and 1 that weekend, but we played them so tough. And, and uh, I, I remember the first game, DJ LeMayu struck out to end the game with the bases loaded against the guy throwing 99 miles an hour, Josh Fields. And I remember him fouling a pitch straight back where you could tell he just missed the ball. And, it, and he was this close to squaring it up. And I had this vision that he had hit this grand slam and won the game for us. But of course he didn't and struck out. And the next day we had a tremendous rally in the eighth inning and tied the game and scored seven runs in the bottom of the eighth inning and had to go ahead and run on third with our best hitter up Blake Dean and, and he didn't get the hit and they scratched a run across and, 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 and won the game eight to seven in the third game. Uh, we were winning 10 to three and, and our pitching got tired and they came back and tied the game and, and we went 12 innings and, and, and the game was still tied. There was the travel curfew. And I just remember how, how well we played and came up so short, just so, so close. And everybody had written us off. And then we turned around and won 23 in a row and won the West and went to Omaha. <laughs> and and uh, the next year won the national championship and you know and you know you just can't give up you just got to keep believing and you just got to keep plugging away and no matter how gloomy things seem and uh, you know when I when I look back at this weekend you know I, I I just look at so many positive things that that we did. We out hit the other team all three games. We had so many clutch hits and clutch home runs. We had two phenomenal starting pitching performances again. We had some clutch relief pitching. Um, you know, our, our, our players came from behind in a game that seemingly we were out of. And then after, after, you know, a, a tough loss that we were one strike away from winning. We went out there and played our hearts out in the final game and our starting pitcher pitched tremendous ball game. You know, and, and it, was a, it was a tough environment. We had a lot of things go against us, you know, and, you know, it, it was very, very frustrating. And I thought our guys showed a lot of poise in the face of a lot of tough a uh, tough situation and you know and it, it we just came up short you know we played three games and got outscored by four runs and we got we out hit the other team and you know and, and here we are at the end of the day getting getting beat all three games and uh can't tell you how how frustrated everybody is and how disappointed everybody is and looks gloomy. And I, I know we're staring at the number one team in the country coming in with, you know, guy that's pitched two consecutive no hitters and everybody's ready to write us off. And I've been through this before, you know, it's what happens when you're old, you know, you have a lot of experiences. I'm just not going to give up. I'm just not going to, it's just not my genes to, to give up and I'm going to keep working hard with the guys and we're going to try to stay positive and get these kids to, to uh, keep believing. And what good does it do to give up? What good does it do to be down on them? What good does it do to, to throw in the towel? We're not going to do that. We're just going to keep plugging away and believing and, in, and, in, and in, in something good will happen. I, I can't predict when it's going to happen or, when that moment's going to happen, but when you when you use examples of when it did happen, like 2008, it gives the kids hope. When you lose hope, you lost everything. All right, go to Taylor. Hey, Coach. Uh, last week you were talking about Cade Beloso. You made some mechanical tweaks with his swing. Um, did you see those things you guys worked on translate to his at bats this uh, this past weekend? And just what did you sort of take away from his at bats this weekend? Taylor, I think Cade's at bats were a microcosm of our whole team this weekend. 
it felt like he was so close to, to bursting out. I could see his demeanor at the plate being so different. I, he, he'd smoke a ball down the right field line. The ball would be fouled by a foot. He'd smoke a ball in the hole, but the second baseman in, on that artificial turf is playing 30 feet in the outfield way over in the hole, and he makes, makes a smash in the hole look like a routine play. Um, there was one moment in the first game we're up one to nothing. Gavin had hit a home run to give us a one nothing lead. And we get runners. We get two, two out base hits in a row. Cruz and, uh, and Doty get base hits and the pitcher falls behind two and oh, uh, Cade Beloso lays off two pitches to get the count to two and oh. And I turned to Eddie Smith and I said, He's going to hit a three-run homer right here. And he, he's going to put us up four to nothing. And here comes the pitch, and Beloso is just this late on the pitch. And instead of him hitting a ball over the scoreboard in right field, he's just a little bit late, and he flies out to left center field. And he comes back to the dugout, and he, and he just – you could see it in his face. He was just that late on the pitch. Everything was perfect, except he was just that late. And I could just see how close he was. And had he just been a little bit more decisive on his swing and just been a little bit more out in front, his batting practice before the game was tremendous. He must have hit 10 balls out over that scoreboard in batting practice. He hadn't done that all year. And I just felt like, oh, my gosh, this is that moment. He's just going to burst out. But it didn't happen. Had he done it, we take a four to nothing lead. I think we go on to win that game. But that's how we're just, we're just missing just a little bit. We're just misfiring a little bit. And it's the difference between winning and losing, you know. And then I, think he's, I think it's coming for him. I think it's going to get there. And, and uh, I just think he's just – just missing a little bit, but I think it's, I think it's still going to be there. And one of these days it's going to, it's going to fall in place for him and he's going to get hot. Nolan and I were talking on the plane coming back. It, he, listen, he hasn't had the same kind of career. I don't mean to make the same correlation, but I remember when Blake Dean in 2009, about this point in the season was hitting about 230 after his 2008 season was phenomenal. And Blake was so frustrated. He was about 20 games into the season, 25 games into the season. And he was hitting about 230. And everybody was like, oh, you should give up on Blake Dean. You should give up on Blake Dean. And I said, I'm not giving up on Blake Dean. And he was so frustrated. He was met. And then all of a sudden, it just, I remember he hit a home run against Alabama on Sunday. And all of a sudden, pooh, he just took off and led us to a national championship. You know, those guys that are hitters, all of a sudden it just comes together for them. And I, I just have to believe that's going to happen for Cade Beloso. All right, we'll go to Jack from Tiger TV. Hey, Coach, I hope you're enjoying this beautiful day. Do you mind, honestly, uh, talking about perspective? A lot of people want to talk about the one in five record SEC play, but those are really good teams, and most teams in this country that play that schedule would probably be one in five. And it's not like we were getting blown out in those games. I mean, as you referred to as snake bit, and it was like that. Those were competitive games. It's early in SEC play, and, you know, a couple series down the road, you could look at it and makes up for those series. I just wanted to see if you have any thoughts on the grander picture of what was happening. Well, Jack, you know, it's a double-edged sword. You know, you're right. We're – they're really ultra competitive games and, you know, uh, people, you know, look, again, when you're old, like I am, you know, you coach over 2000 games. There's, there's people that say, Hey, a loss is a loss. They're right. You know, whether you lose by one or you lose by 20, a loss is a loss, but I've learned in 39 years, it's not exactly the truth. When you're not competitive, it's a lot worse. You know, when you, when you lose by a run, 
you toss and turn all night. You know, one decision you made, like I said after the game yesterday, I wish I had put uh, Gilbert on and pitched to Beck, you know, because that's how I felt at that moment. You know, we don't know what the result would have been if we'd have walked Gilbert and pitched to Beck. Who knows? He might have hit a three-run homer. We don't know. But the natural feeling is I wish I had put the kid on and pitched to the other guy because it didn't work out by pitching to Gilbert. So you toss and turn over one decision or, you know, if this ball had bounced this way or, you know, one little thing had happened, it's, it's hard to, to accept a loss. But I can tell you when you're not competitive in a game, oh, my gosh, that's, re that's really bad. That's when you wonder if you're good enough, if you even have the players to be competitive. That's, that's the worst feeling in the world. I know we have the players to be competitive and I know we're just a little bit snake bit right now, you know, and I just know that it's a pitch, it's a play, it's a, it's an at bat here and there. We obviously have the ability to hit the pitchers in this league. We got 16 hits the other day. We out hit this team all three games, but at a critical moment in the game, when we need to get this, this hit, you know, we're having a strikeout when we when we need to put a ball in play or we're, you know, when we need to make a key pitch, we're not, you know, we're, we're missing our spot just a little bit or, you know, a decision that we make is not quite working out for us, you know, and then that, that's what happens when you lose those close games. And it's, it's frustrating for everybody when those things happen. But all you can do is just keep plugging away and keep fighting and keep believing in yourselves. And then one day that close loss turns into a close victory and, and it feels better and your confidence grows and you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. And before you know it, the season is going in the, in the other direction and, you, and there'll be a turning point and you'll feel it and you'll feel good about it. But this is what happens when you play in a really tough league. Somebody has to win and somebody has to lose the game. And you look around the league and, and you see it happens. Really great teams lose tough games. And it doesn't give you any solace. You, all you really care about is your own team. But you know it, it happens to everybody. I'm right, going to uh, Ed Daniels. Hey, Paul, doubling back to what you had said uh, earlier, do you really – feel that uh, even at this point in the season that some people have given up on you coach well I don't know Ed. honestly <laughs> if I I don't I you know yeah you listen you all have a job to do and you report the news and and I respect all of you and I think you know that I've been here for 15 years and and I've I, I'd like to believe that I have a really great relationship with the members of the media and I have a great relationship with the fans, but I can't listen to everything that's being said out there. You know, people, people have opinions and I think that's wonderful. They're, you know, they, they're passionate about their LSU baseball tigers and that's what makes it special to work at LSU. But if I listen to what everybody says, <laughs> I would, it would drive me crazy and I can't do that. You know, I have to have a mindset, you know, that I have to believe in my players. I have to believe in the team and I have to keep a very positive outlook on things. And, you know, if I, if I listen to what everybody says, you know, the positives or the negatives, it, you know, I, then I, I would take that same attitude and I can't be like that with the players. I have to, I have to stay positive with them. And um, because I believe in them, I believe that they're going to, that they're, I believe they're good players. And I believe that they're, my job is to keep them believing in them in themselves. Nothing positive will happen if I don't keep them believing in themselves. And so uh, I'm sure there's some people out there that are frustrated and probably not saying the nicest things, but I don't know that. I don't listen to, to, to what they say. I can't, you know, so I'm sure there's a lot of very loyal people out there that are going to stick with us 
they've seen they've seen our teams through the years and they know that we're gonna that our mo is that we're gonna fight through the tough times and keep getting better through the throughout the year we do it every year and this year will be no exception we'll keep getting better it may not meet everybody's standard i i can't control what they what they think, you know, what I can do is do the best we can. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And we'll keep getting better as the year progresses. All right, we'll go to Scooter. Hey, coach, uh, two things are kind of jumping out with with the struggles. Uh, on, on offense, the number of times you're striking out. And then on defense, the number of walks you're giving up. Is that two of the most frustrating things to try to get uh, straightened out? Well, you know, Scooter, um, I, I'll, the short answer is yes. <clears throat> short answer is yes. The, the game has changed a lot. And, I, and I, overall, I mean, if you look at Major League Baseball, strikeouts are way up offensively. And for – you know, a lot of people are okay with that. But home runs are way up as well. And I don't know if it's filtered down to the younger players that they feel that way too. <laughs> you know, but that I don't know that I've had a team that has struck out as much as we're striking out. I, I don't know what the statistics show through the years, but we're striking out at a – at a pretty high rate for what I'm used to. Um, but if you look around our league, a lot of teams are striking out a lot. I watched Florida play South Carolina late at night the other night. And Florida struck out 19 times. And Florida's one of the best teams in the country. And they struck out 19 times. And then we followed them up the next day by striking out 17 times in a game. I think part of it is because the quality of the arms is so much greater than it's ever been in college baseball. More harder throwers, more, more strikeout pit, cap, more pitchers that are capable of striking out batters. Um, but also what comes with harder throwers is pitchers that walk more batters as well. So um, I'm not a big fan of our pitchers, walking batters either and and you know so it's it's not the kind of baseball that I grew up with nor do I particularly like I don't like to see walks and I don't like to see strikeouts I like to see the ball put in play and see good defense and good base running just as a baseball aficionado of a guy that loves the game I like to see less walks and less strikeouts by both teams, but it's, it's just kind of the nature of the game nowadays. Um, so I'm, a, I'm alarmed by our team striking out more. I'm also alarmed by our team walking more batters and we're going to continue to try to trim back both of those, but it's frustrating, you know, and, and uh, you no, know, I mean, you know, Ty Floyd came in the other night and I don't know if he struck out the side in the eighth inning, but, you know, he comes in, he's got a good arm. He strikes, he dominates the eighth inning. And then in the ninth inning, you know, after the suspension, you know, he comes back and he's throwing 95 miles an hour and, you know, he, he gets the first batter, but then he, he walks the next batter and that batter eventually comes around and scores. So, you know, the, the walk is a, is a, it, it, it generally bites you. And, you know, he wasn't missing by much. They weren't, it wasn't like he was way up here and way out here. You know, they were close pitches. But, you know, generally speaking, the walk can come back to haunt you. And um, I've said it a million times, you know, there's no defense against a base on balls. And offensively, there were times if we could just put the ball in play, you know, we could score a run and, you know, the strikeout has hurt us. So it's things that we're going to, you know, we got to keep working on and we got to, you know, can't just accept the fact, but 
think it, it, it is part of our struggle, Scooter, in answer to your question, yes. Yeah. Coach, uh, without the game last week, I'm sure you're very excited to get back on the field tomorrow night. Um, just, do you feel like these, these midweek games could really be a benefit for your team right now? Well, I'm, I'm excited about playing. I hope the rain holds off. We're, we're playing a really good team, South Alabama. They just swept their series this weekend at Northwestern State. So traditionally, South Alabama has had a great team. Mark Calvey's an outstanding coach. And um, you know, they were our last game that we played last year before the pandemic hit. So, um, you know, they, they're, they're going to come in very confident and and uh, we got to be ready to go. You know, there's no time to hang your heads and feel sorry for yourself. So, uh, you know, we, we're going to be limited with the pitchers available. Obviously, you know, we're not going to have Ty Floyd. We're not going to have, probably not going to have Fontenot available. Um, you know, yesterday, you know, having to uh, finish the first game and then ended up going extra innings, taxed us. And then, of course, uh, you know, playing the second game. So, no, no practice today. Um, you know, guys are going to have to get themselves mentally ready because we don't have access to them today. Um, so we got to be ready to go. And then we got this, you know, short week before we got Vanderbilt coming in on Thursday night, the number one team in the country. So it's going to be a big week for us. Um, we got to, we got to, we got to shake this off, this Tennessee thing off quickly because we've got four tough ball games in a short period of time here. I guess just to follow up on that, the idea that, yeah, you, you know, it is a short week. Is that a good thing coming off of what you just had that you get right back out there and get at it? I know managing the staff is going to be the challenge for sure. Well, whether it's a good thing or bad thing, Mike, is not for anybody to say. It is what it is. We, we, it's baseball. You know, we don't, we don't get a long time to decipher it and come to grips with it. It is what it is. You just – you know, it's a, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. You know, it's a good thing to get right back out there. It's a bad thing that you don't get a lot of time to digest it. You, you, you got to get out. It is what it is. It's baseball. And the kids know that. You, you got you, you to gotta put it behind you quickly and you got to be ready to go. And it's, it's what you choose. This is a sport we play. And uh, it's, not, it's not a sport for the weak of mind. You got it. You got to. You got to play the game, analyze it, celebrate it, digest it, evaluate it, and and then dispose of it and get ready to play the next day. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, we can go back to Jack from Tiger TV. Coach, just one last question. I was just looking at the stat line. I just want to see your thoughts on this. We currently have forty-two home runs on the season. Uh, the problem is 24 of those home runs have been solo shots. Just want to see any thoughts on that stat. Yeah, Jack. I mean, I love the three run homer more than the solo homer. I think traditionally there's more solo homers because pitchers have a tendency to challenge hitters more when there's not runners on base, when there's runners on base, you know, pitchers have a tendency to be more fine with their pitches, especially with runners in scoring position. You know, um, I know a lot of people, I think Mike Cobbles asked me about it a couple of times, you know, about Dylan Cruz batting in the three hole versus the leadoff spot. You know, I've added Cruz three hole a couple of times, including up at Tennessee. You know, the, the game that he batted three hole, I don't think he saw fastball the entire game. You know, including the first inning, he started off the game with three straight change ups. He struck out on three straight change ups. Um, you know, when, when you bat in the middle of the order, you know, they, they don't like to challenge you very often. And especially when there's runners in scoring position, especially when there's runners on base and, and, you, and you have the potential for a multi-run home run. When there's nobody on base, they're going to they're gonna challenge you more frequently. And that's, they're, they're more apt to give up a home run. So I think there's something to that, you know, and that's why you see more solo homers than multi-run home runs. Um, and I think that's just that's just a product of how pitchers pitch hitters partially. Okay, uh, time for uh, Michael Cobble. Yeah, coach, uh, just pitching plans. Have you uh, laid them out or? 
Well, tomorrow we're tomorrow we're going to start Will Helmers, but I think you're going to see several pitchers pitch tomorrow. Try to piece it together tomorrow night, and then uh, and then this this week we'll we'll save it for uh, the announcement for um, officially we'll save it for Wednesday. But probably wouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out with the short rest. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Munari. Okay, guys. All right.